Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Are ready to get back in our Father's Word? New book today we begin, the great book of Matthew. Matthew uh, in Mark 4 is called Levi. Why? Because he was a Levi. And, uh, and a carrier of forth, a child of day, of offspring of David, and so forth. But what about the gospel according to St. Matthew? What, what, what is gospel? The gospel is an Anglo-Saxon word that means God's spell or, or, um, or the good news, uh, some would want to say, and how fantastic it is. But God named him Matthew, which is to say the gift of Yah. And Matthew and all the disciples were a gift from God to bring forth the very word of Christ, the Savior, whereby we could attain that salvation. Let's talk a little bit about all four of the Gospels, if we may. This Gospel of Matthew is, as you will note in your companion Bibles, the Lord is presented as Yahweh's King. Uh, Behold thy King, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 6. Behold, I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, and Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 15. So here we have that royal genealogy as it would come forth. In the book of Mark, the Lord is presented as Yahweh's servant. Uh, Behold my servant, Isaiah 42, 1. Uh, Behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch, uh, Zechariah 3.3. 3. Uh, hence, no genealogy is required as he is presented as what he is before God, relatively the lowest earthly position, the ideal servant. And what was his duty as a servant? Salvation. And to pay that price. Um, in the book of Luke, the, the physician, the Lord is presented as Yahweh's man. Uh, behold, the man whose name is the branch, uh, Zechariah 6.12. Hence, the human genealogy is required upward uh, to Adam in Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And we're, we'll be talking about that more here in a little bit. And he is presented as what he is before man, uh, the ideal man. That's why he's called the son of man as a flesh body when he walked the very earth. And then comes the book of John. And in John, the Lord is presented as Yahweh himself. Behold your God, um, Isaiah 40, verse 9. In that day shall Yahweh's branch, Messiah, be beautiful and glorious, Isaiah 4, 3. Hence, no genealogy is required, and he is presented as what he is before God divine. And then I could add, as we will be discussing, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, A virgin shall conceive. She will bear a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which is to say, God with us. Again, presenting him as God himself. Very divine. So, having said that, the beautiful Gospels, that God spell and that uh, good news that came forth whereby sinners could find repentance, forgiveness, atonement, and, and have a happy life. Happy in Him because He brings forth happiness with understanding. Uh, having said that, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, the great book of Matthew. The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and that genealogy is set forth. Verse 2, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, 
and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and uh, which um, uh, would bring forth that, um, that uh, king line, Judah always being the king line. Verse 3, and Judas, th this is the Greek name for Judah, okay, in the Hebrew tongue, begat Perezanzera of Tamar. And Tamar had to, um, with God's help, brought forth these. And Pharaoh begat Eshram, and Eshram begat Aram. Verse 4, and Aram begat um, Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Neathon, and Neathon begat Solomon. Now, how about this with Abraham begetting Isaac and then coming forth with Judah? Do you know where that is written? All the way back, if you would, in 2 Samuel, in chapter 7, and um, you can read it in verse 12 of, of, the sec of 2 Samuel, verse 8. And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That being the very kingdom of God, as we bring forth um, the very genealogy you got to be real careful, though. Not everybody teaches correctly the genealogy. And even within that is a, is a meaning that is very, very important. And we will be covering that in this lecture. Let's go with the next verse. Verse 5, And Solomon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obad begat Jesse. And of course, Jesse would be the father of who? Verse 6, And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon, Solomon and of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Uh, and so it is. Now, you know, many people, uh, who is genealogy are we reading? Well, it says it's the generation of Jesus Christ, but really it's Joseph's. Mary's husband's genealogy. Let's, let's skip, if we may, uh, all the way down to verse um, 16. I'm going to give the character generator a moment to catch up with that. We'll go down to verse 16, and let's find out whose genealogy we're really talking about. And the reason I stopped on Solomon, there's a reason for it. A very good reason, a reason that is overlooked by most teachers and students of God's Word. And it's important enough that I, I want to um, explain that in detail. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ, Christos. Now, therefore, what did Joseph have to do with Christ's birth? Nothing. Because Mary was impregnated by the hand of God, the uh, the Holy Spirit passing over her. And um, so certainly um, this genealogy doesn't have anything to do with the actual birth of Christ, but it has to do with adoption, that is to say through Joseph, who would become the husband of Mary, um, who was that virgin that would conceive that's the way a virgin conceives, is by divine intervention from Almighty God. And, and this, is, this should not be news to you if you're a student of God's Word, because God would say way back in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, let us create man in our image. He included himself. Therefore, as you can read in John chapter 14, Christ would say, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father because he was in the exact image of Almighty God. <clears throat> now, if that be the case, then how do we know <clears throat> the genealogy of Christ? Because he was supposed to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Judah was uh, 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 of the king line, not the priest line. Levi was of the priest line. 
therefore, we have to understand what happened here. You, you understand this by going, the true genealogy of Christ, by going to Luke chapter 1, where we would read, you're not going to have it, but make a note of it. Chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. That's a date, okay? And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Aaron was the chief Levite, okay? And, and uh, Elizabeth to be married to a priest, a, Lev a Lev Levitical priest, would have to be a full-blood Levite herself. Okay. So let there be no doubt about it. Elizabeth was of the house of Levi. Well, what does that have to do with Christ's birth? A great deal. Because this would be the father and the mother of John the Baptist. But we read then as we continue in this uh, first chapter, <coughs> we would read... Uh, that in uh, verse 32, uh, uh, verse 31, we'll take it. Uh, uh, Mary is visited by an angel. Let's go with verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. That's to say, Yahweh, Yeshua, which is to say, Yahweh's Savior. That's what his name is going to be. So here you have Elizabeth who was too old to bear, but by divine intervention she would bring forth John the Baptist. And here we have Mary who was not even married, too young or too soon to, to um, be with child. Verse 32, And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And there comes the king line, okay? Verse 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's eternally. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. It is an eternal kingdom, and when you love him, you're a part of that. That king line, 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She was a virgin. 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And there you have it, Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior. God's promise back in Genesis 1, let us create man, flesh man, in our image. You have this one, this Emmanuel. Verse 36, listen carefully and learn. Behold, and behold, thy cousin, you know what a cousin is? Thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month uh, with her who was called barren. In other words, one too old, the other too young, seemingly. But how does one become a cousin? Well, you've got to be uh, of, um, uh, the mothers must be sisters or brothers, and the father or likewise, or you don't have a cousin. So how is it that, um, David, being of the house of Judah, and Christ was certainly of that seed, how could possibly um, we bring the priesthood into this, which is to say a Levite? Well, Elizabeth was a full-blood Levite, meaning what? Meaning, as we will learn in, um, in, in another chapter here in a moment, that um, Mary's father was, in fact, of the tribe of David. But Mary's mother was a full-blood Levite. Therefore, as it is written, Christ would become a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, which is to say, he would be king of kings from the king line, David, and a, and, and a lord of lord, the priest line, 
through the line of Levi, being forever after the order of Melchizedek. But uh, immediately after this, her cousin, 37, for with, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. It is with man, but not with our father. And Mary said, Behold, the, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to the, thy word. And the angel departed from her. Mary arose, and in those days, and went into the, the hill country with haste, into the city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias, and saluted Elizabeth. This is the same day she conceived. Elizabeth is six months. Okay? And... Um, and um, rather, uh, five months rather in verse 41 and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary the babe leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit I mean, then when did the Holy Spirit begin dwelling with man the day of conception that is to say there is life in the womb at conception for the Holy Spirit was there in person to where even, not, not a, a birthed individual, but an individual still in the womb could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit and leapt in his Levitical mother's womb. Then, what, why is this all important? It's very important to understand the true genealogy of Christ. And as much as Joseph had nothing to do um, genetically with the offspring of Mary. She was a virgin. Therefore, the genealogy of Jesus falls upon Mary herself. So I, I want to cover with you, if I may, as we would continue, let's go to chapter 3, where you find the true genealogy of Christ, uh, not Matthew chapter 1. And the Holy, verse 22 of chapter 3. And the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. This is when his ministry would begin being as was supposed, as was supposed means as by law. Now, so what you're going to have here is in-laws, okay? And um, as by law, the son of Joseph, which was the son uh, of Heli. It was a common practice that if a woman was a single daughter and married a man, the genealogy transferred to the man. This is much as it is today. People, in as much as our rules and regulations come from uh, general law, then also when a man marries a woman, her relatives become his in-laws as by law. They are related only by law. So Christ was related to Joseph only by law. But then who was Mary's father? Well, we find out that it was Heli, and Heli was of the tribe of Judah. But Mary having a full-blood Levite cousin means Mary's mother was a full-blood Levite. Therefore, Christ would fall in both tribes, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Now, why I brought you here, you find out in verse 31. You have the genealogy, not of Joseph, but of Mary. And we come down to verse 31 of chapter 3, the great book of Luke. It reads, which was the son of Meliah, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Mattathah, which was the son of Nathan, not Solomon, Nathan, which was the son of David. So Christ did not come through Solomon. Christ came through Nathan, his brother. Um, therefore, uh, we see the, um, the uh, difference. Is that important? Of course it is. Because it lets you know the true genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as many of you have heard me teach 
the birth of Christ, the very date itself, can be well established by the course of Abiah, which Zechariah was at at the time of the, um, the, the uh, conception and, um, and so forth there with the Lord Jesus Christ. So what, ha what have we learned there? Think about it a moment. The genealogy listed in Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy of Joseph, who was Christ's father only by adoption. He was a good man, a very good man. But he was only a father by adoption, just as many people are adopted into Christianity or children of God through adoption by believing upon the house of Israel's very Savior, Yahweh. That is to say, Jesus Christ. So, but Christ's true genealogy, different than this, um, the genealogy listed here in Matthew, was Nathan, not Solomon. And, and so it is. Um, so uh, then we would continue on. Let's go back to chapter 1, the great book of Matthew. And there you've learned something that is very important of the priesthood and the kingship. And you learn why Christ can be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which would mean he had to be a Levite, and he was, through his mother, uh, Mary's mother, his grandmother, I should say, he fit the bill for both of priests forever after the order of Melchizedek. So let's return then to chapter 1 and the next verse following that. We find verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David unto the carrying away unto Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away of Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. And there we have that split up, a period before David, with David, and, and after David. Uh, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And, and this virgin was carrying a child. This man she was engaged to had never been with her. Verse 19, And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and he was, he was a very good man, a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. That's to say privately so that there was no embarrassment to her. He was going to um, uh, put her away whereby um, she would be uh, away from him. What happened then, verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord, that's the Lord's presence himself, appeared unto him, in a dream, this is in a vision, saying, Joseph, uh, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Uh, that is, in, in the Hebrew is Yeshua which means Yah's Savior, meaning Yah our Savior, God with us. For he shall save his people from their sins, and certainly we need it. That, that's as it is, that man falls short, unfortunately, but with atonement, that's forgiveness for sins, for he who paid the price, the sacrifice for one and all times, then certainly made it possible for one to rise above the fray of flesh and live a peaceful, holy life. Uh, verse 22, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, 30, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, 
which being interpreted is God with us. Now, many people ponder and wonder about Yahweh, Yahshua, but really, this really makes it, wh where did the prophet say this incidentally? It was in the great book of Isaiah. You will find it there, and you will find it in the seventh chapter of Isaiah, and it will be listed in the 14th verse of that seventh chapter of Isaiah. And it's important for you to know this is not a new thing. This happened 740 something years before Christ, that God gave this prophecy. And in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, 14, it says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, that is a sign, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And, of course, Emmanuel being interpreted is God with us. So naturally, when Christ walked the earth, God was with us. God will not ask you to do something he would not do himself. That is to say, he, flesh is not that pleasant a ride sometimes. It can be difficult. Well, guess what? Emmanuel, God with us, it was difficult for him also, but he still maintained the grace, the beauty, and the perfect man and the hardship would even come on the cross where they would nail him to a cross as a common criminal. But he did that for you. That was our Father. How precious it is, the love of God for his children. And what does he ask in return? Your love is to return that love, to love him, to be with him to honor Him and to love Him. What a, what a neat way to be pleasing to Almighty God and to be loved of and by Him, but that He would do this for us, that He would send this Savior where on believing upon Him, we could have that eternal life and His eternal kingship. Verse 23, then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. He married her. And certainly it would come to pass. He was a good man. There would be a time later that he would flee to Egypt with uh, listening to that same angel of the Lord and protect that son when Herod would want to butcher all of the children under two. He would save Christ's life in that way. God always protecting from above that office of Savior. Verse 25, after taking his wife, and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn a son, and he called his name Jesus. He did as he was instructed. And so it was. Jesus meaning what? Yahweh's Savior, or Yah does save. An example of the very love of God. Now let's think, let's ponder on these things. What was this? A gospel that's good news. And all of this indeed is good news. And you should listen to it carefully. It is important to know that God never leaves a page unturned, a peg not centered. For truth is very important. And that truth is easy to find if you will simply pay attention to the very natural nature that God brought forth himself and that he would, the, the relationship of these people who would be utilized by Almighty God to bring forth this Savior and this gospel of which you can become a part by believing upon Him. Because as it is written in John chapter 3, verse 16, God so loved this world and the, His people in it that He gave His only begotten Son, that would be Christ, that 
uh, for, and all that would, he sent his only begotten son, that all that would believe upon him, that's what it takes is belief. You can't believe part way. You can't believe halfway. You either believe or you don't. But if in believing and following, inherit eternal, everlasting life. This, this eternal means life without um, uh, ceasing to exist. Well, if God created all of us in the first earth age, then you've never stopped existing because that's what it means. Not, uh, never ceases existing from the very foundation to the very end and into to the eternity. So therefore, it is a misnomer to say pre-existed because no one has ever stopped existing. Not even Satan has ceased existing. He right now is held by Michael and, and held from uh, imprisonment until he is cast out on this earth as the false son, which is to say the Antichrist, the false savior. That's why it's important that you know who the true savior is, that you know his genealogy and you know how to, the key to David, which unlocks doors that no man can close on you and close doors that no one can open because you have the truth and the truth will always set you free. That's the word of God and how precious it is. We'll pick this up in the next chapter in the next lecture. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question pertaining to a certain reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. Our Father is the judge, and you have the right for spiritual discernment to discern what you hear, if it be of truth or falsehood. And it is your responsibility to do that, to concentrate, meditate, and pray about things. God will always take care of his own. You can count on it, even in troublesome times. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. What a pleasure it is to hear from you. Now. Got a prayer request? You don't need that number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He does. When you let him know you love him, that gives him unction to hear you, so to contemplate. So let him know that you love him. Once you do that, that's so very important because that's what he wants from you. Do you want proof? Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I don't want your burnt offering. I want your grace. It's just say your love. Let him know. Won't you do that, Father? Around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. Uh, did God create all the races on the sixth day? Yes, he did. What did he create on the eighth day? On the eighth day, he created in the Hebrew manuscripts, Eth Ha'adam. That is a man through which Christ would come. And that's why this genealogy is so very important. You're not to mess with foolish genealogies, but this genealogy is not foolish. It's your, sal it's your salvation. So it becomes very important. 
that he created that one and then Mother Eve, which umbilical cord to umbilical cord would lead to Mary, which would bring forth that Son of God, that we would have that forgiveness. Joshua from West Virginia, I am a drug addict and I want to be clean and straighten up my life, but I can't seem to shake what that monkey off my back. How do I go about asking God for help? Be honest with him. Tell him your problem. Don't make any promises. Ask for his help. And uh, he, he hears those that love him. You know, many people today, we have fires burning in the west and we have floods and houses sinking in the west and uh, east and people wonder well, what's happening. Well, when you bring perversion into our military, into our government, and when you go totally against God's word, he's going to ring some bells. He's going to thump some gourds. But he will never bother those that love him. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will always watch out for you. Now, if you're hooked on drugs and the false Christ comes, guess what the first thing he's going to offer you? A hit. He knows your weakness. He knows all of our weaknesses. He'll jump right on it. So you got to strengthen yourself and be pleasing to God and rise above the troubles of this world whereby you know and understand what's going down because we're seeing some awesome, awesome things at this very moment. Jim from Kentucky. What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Luke chapter 12, verse 10 will let you know to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is if you are one of God's elect. No one else has to worry about it. But if you are one of God's elect and are delivered up before the Antichrist, if you refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through you as it's written in Mark chapter 13 that you're not to premeditate what you'll say beforehand, but allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. If you refuse that, it's unforgivable. I personally, do. I, I know it can't happen. I know God's elect very well. And if anything, they have a problem of talking too much. Uh, they will not deny the Holy Spirit. Um, Lucia from Pennsylvania, I hope I'm saying that right. Where does it talk about olive oil in James? Chapter five, verse 14. If someone is ill, then anoint them with the oil of our people, the olive oil. And the oil is not what does the healing, but it is your obedience to use it that cause, gets God's attention to touch. And that touch of healing is awesome. Uh, John from Louisiana. My name is John and I'm from Louisiana. I'm eight years old and my question is, why didn't God make earth like it was in the first earth age? Well, because, because Satan and a third of his children rebelled against him. I mean, they had it real easy. He wanted in a position where men would kind of have to sweat his, the brow a little to work the old earth. And that's why he brought this in and brought a savior. He made it real easy for anybody that will believe, but for everybody else. But it's going to go back, John, as it was in the beginning. It's going to be, it's a beautiful place. When, when you do away with um, the firmament on earth and put it back in its pre first uh, existence, then you don't have any storms. You don't have a jet stream. You don't have tornadoes, hurricanes. You have a perfect earth. And uh, just as we know, we have found uh, buttercups in the tundra of Alaska. Buttercups don't grow there. It's frozen. But they did at one time, and they shall again. Uh, Robert from Maryland. Did Paul ever go by another name? And if so, what was it? He did. He, he went by Saul. Saul means desired. And his name was changed to Paul which means small or even little. It was an humbling thing for him. 
when, when the, he was a desired one in the ministry, oh, I mean, he could destroy the church because he, was, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He did not believe that or, or recognize that Christ had come. So he was destroying the Christian church. And then he humbled himself. And you know, he always apologized for that through his writings for having harmed the church. Uh, and uh, he would call himself even the least because of that. So he has that name, Paul the Little One. It's, it's a humbling thing. And that's what made him so great was his humility. Danny from Florida. In the Bible, it says when you go in your closet to pray, you are letting your spirit speak through you. Will you explain this, please? It simply means, you know, uh, the parable of the same chapter that you're kind of saying is the rich man would pray publicly so that people could hear him pray, not God. He was praying to put on a show. So you say, if that's the way it is with you, you need to go in your closet where nobody can hear you and then talk to the Father. In other words, don't ever talk to the Father to put on a show for somebody. That, that's what it means. And then God will hear you. you. You can talk all you want to praying out in public. When maybe it's all right to play in the, pray in the public for a sick person or someone else when you're not doing it to make a show. But if you're making it to, to, if you're making prayers for a show to say, I'm a holy Joe, God's not going to hear you. But if you go in your closet and you humble yourself before him, he will hear your prayer. Manny from South Carolina. Where can I find the scripture uh, that speaks about murder and the difference between whether or not it was premeditated. Deuteronomy chapter 18, 19 rather, and um, Mark, Matthew, uh, Numbers chapter 35, okay? And um, there you will, the, the difference is drawn out in Deuteronomy 19. Read it carefully. Harold from Tennessee. And, and don't be a scripture lawyer and go off trying to, you have to hear both sides to know a truth. Is it a crime of passion? See, there's some reasons that God can understand why someone would harm somebody. Let's take the case of the guy in Texas the other day that uh, a man was molesting his five-year-old daughter and he beat, he beat him. Well, God's not gonna hold him responsible for that. Uh, Harold from Tennessee. I have been watching you since 1989 and have learned more than I learned my whole life. Often people come to me and know and ask questions. Is it all right if I refer them to watch your program? Of course it is. But when you can answer a program, that's why, uh, answer a question, that's why you study. And that's why people are drawn to you because you have the answers. That, that makes a big difference. That's God's own uh, truth at work. Praise God. R.J. from Florida. What scriptures refer to the doctrine of the serpent seed? I cannot find this in the Bible. Well, it's certainly there. It's the first, it's the first prophecy in the Bible, basically. It's Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, where Christ says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. So that is the serpent's seed. But the serpent means the glistening one. That's one of Satan's names. Well, how do you know it's one of Satan's names? Well, have you, have you ever read uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, that old devil, the serpent? Or Revelation chapter 20, cast in a, the abyss, the old devil, the serpent, uh, Lucifer, uh, the word Lucifer is not there, but it, that means the bright morning star. He tries to claim everything that Christ is, only he's a fraud. Uh, Martha from South Carolina, where can I find the Song of Solomon in the Bible? You will find the Song of Solomon 
just before the great book of Isaiah. Okay. Now, in certain Bibles, the Song of Solomon is titled Canticles. Okay. The Canticles are the Song of Solomon. Same wording, basically, but a uh, different name, mean, but different language, meaning the same thing. But next, in the King James, good old King James, it's the next book just before the great book of Isaiah. Stanley from Mississippi, where can I find that Lucifer wanted to sit on the mercy seat and take God's place? Thank you. You have to go by the name Lucifer went by in Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, God let us know that he's not our rock, okay? So he named him Tyrus. And Tyrus, in the Hebrew tongue, means rock. And it lets you know that God, first of all, created him. He says, all the beauty, I made you the full pattern. My, he, he was a good person and earned everything, even to be the cherub, and he was a cherubim that protected the mercy seat. Uh, you've seen the, um, the man-made uh, production of the Ark of the Covenant, and it has the two cherubims on each side. In reality, in heaven, he was one of those. But then, as it is written in Ezekiel 28, he be took pride guiding. I mean, after all, he was the protecting cherub full of beauty. I mean, God made him the full pattern. He earned it. Why don't I sit on that mercy seat? And uh, that's, that's what was his downfall. The 18th verse of that lets you know he will be turned to ashes from within. When uh, at, the, at the second uh, death, which is to say the last verse in Revelation chapter 20, Elaine from Missouri, does God talk to people now like whisper in their ears? Thank you. God speaks in many ways, many, many ways. Uh, when, when you love him and when you speak to him, uh, does he literally talk to people? Um, if, if you have a mission and if God is going to use you, he likely will speak to you in one way or another whereby you will know that you do as he says. And with that, he will always give a gift. And that gift is the ability to accomplish what he asks you to do and so forth. Uh, but uh, it is God's promise. If you love him, he'll return that love. You don't even have to, you know, don't, don't ever be one that wants God to put on a circus or a sideshow just so you can have faith. You either have faith without that kind of nonsense, which I'm not, I'm not sacrilegious here talking about God's true actions when he has need to use somebody, but don't pray for it specifically to believe or you'll never get it, okay? That's not the way God does business. Uh, Chad from Montana, I am a musician. Would it be blasphemous for me to take the Bible and put it to music without taking it out of context, of course? Uh, if you feel led to, if the Holy Spirit leads you, go for it. M Marcy, it would not be sacrilegious, of course. Marcy from Ohio, for those that do believe that there is a rapture, will they be punished or will they just come to the realization that they will be here for the tribulation. Thank you. I really enjoy your program. Marcy, let me tell you something. Will they be punished if they do not believe if they believe the rapture? Well, who is who is coming first, the false Christ or the true Christ? If you've studied the book of Revelation, it's so simple a child can understand that Satan comes at the sixth trump. The true Christ doesn't return until the seventh, the farthest one out. Paul made that very clear in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. Now, if they are unlearned and untaught that the false Christ comes first, he's going to claim to be Christ come to rapture people away, come to make them perfect. 
bring the people that don't believe before him. That's why the mother will betray daughter and the father the son. Quite, they think he is Christ and they're saying, my boy's a good boy, bring him up here and convert him. And he's talking to Satan in ignorance. So will they be punished for that? Of course they will. They're not going to make the cut. You can't worship Satan and be a child of God without a lot of repentance going on and getting into God's Word and meditating on it and learning truth. Craig from Louisiana. Where can I find chapter and verse that says that the souls were made, all souls were made at the same time? Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, have you ever heard wisdom speak? Wisdom speaks in Proverbs chapter 8. And wisdom lets you know God created the sons all at the same time. That's his children. There's no, no gender intended there. Uh, you can learn also in the 40th chapter of Job. Where all, they were all there together at the same time in heaven. Job 40. The, they're called stars, the sons of God. Again, no gender intended. Jean from Florida. If a person dies in an unfamiliar place like a nursing home, does someone need to open a window or the, so the spirit can get out or will it be trapped inside? You cannot trap a spiritual body. It would, it, 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 did Christ open the door when he appeared after the crucifixion? No, he walked through the wall. A wall can't stop a person in a spiritual body. Okay, Why, they're in a different dimension. Okay, so I, I know that is an old colloquial belief that if someone dies, you must open the window. Uh, give give God more credit than that. When He says, "The instant the silver cord parts," in Ecclesiastes chapter twelve, verse six and seven, that the spirit returns instantly to the Father when, when the cord breaks. That's what it's talking about then uh, from whence it came. In other words, you're going back where you came from. You came from him. You're going back to him. You might say, even if you're a sinner, yeah, he's the judge. He judges sinners. But hopefully you've repented and you're one of the ones he loves. Dorothy from Illinois. Why is wisdom always referred to as a she in the Bible? Because she's beautiful. Because she's got everything. And because she is, improves lives and she takes care of people, um, that's why wisdom is called she. Uh, she's, she's beautiful, something to behold, something to grope for, to, to that wisdom of understanding. Because from it comes the love of God and happiness, even in these flesh bodies is to know and love and understand. Um, and we go with Susan. Where can I find in the Bible about the first earth age? Second Peter chapter 3 probably is one of the easier places for a person unless you can understand the languages. If you understand the languages, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. It didn't say when, other than the beginning. And then in verse 2, the Hebrew is tuhu vuhu, which is to say, not that the earth was created void and without form, but that it became void and without form because of Satan's rebellion. And uh, God destroyed this, the first earth age as... Uh, as the third chapter of uh, Second Peter so declares. Anthony from Alabama, I really appreciate your teaching. Is there any forerunners for the Antichrist coming? Um, in in um, the first epistle of John, in chapter 1, 2, verse 18, Beloved, it is the last time, the, as you have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists among you. That means teachers against Christ. But no doubt there will be a forerunner because he knows that as Elijah would come to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, plural, 
the false one and the true one. That's what truth will do. Satan knows that. He will make arrangements. Edward from Alabama. Is it okay to be cremated? Will you still go to heaven? There's nothing can hold the spiritual body. And as it is written in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, this body goes back to dirt from which it came. It goes, it's soil, it's, um, and it's going to turn back there. You've got a much more perfect body. Doesn't get old, doesn't, uh, and um, so it is. Tommy from Tennessee. Where can I find breath of life body in my strong concordance? I enjoy your teachings. Thank you very much. According to what language? 109 in the Greek, pneuma is the spirit. And uh, in the Greek also, 5594 is the, um, the breath you breathe, and meaning spiritual body. But probably the best place is in the Hebrew, in, in um, chapter 1, where God breathed the breath of life into man, and that is in the Strong's Concordance, 5397. 5397 is where you find breath of life. And I find right now that I'm out of time. Now, it's good to be back with you, and I thank Dennis for uh, taking the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and, and uh, doing such a good job on it. I appreciate it, and it's good to be back with you all. Let God know you love him. Won't you do that? That's so important to him. I love you, but most of all, he loves you for studying his word. So you stay in it. Let him know you love him, and he'll certainly bless you. Now, we are brought to you by your uh, tithes and offerings if we have helped you. And, and only if we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? When you bless God, guess what? He will always bless you. Most important, though, you know what? You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.